A year ago, we presented this idea when the Russia-Ukraine war started that could Russia be the, what was called the third Rome, you know, so, sometimes also connected to an entity called Magog in kind of like the end of days narrative. And we mentioned there's a famous passage in the Talmud that there's going to be three Romes, but there will, there will not be a fourth Rome. That Mashiach will come before there is a fourth Rome. And this is an idea that goes back centuries, not even in Jewish texts, in general. There's this idea that in history there will be three Romes, or that there are three Romes. So the first Rome was, of course, Rome itself in Italy. And then the second Rome was Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. And then the idea is that once Constantinople fell in the mid-15th century, that Russia, that Moscow took over as this new Rome, this new entity, the third Rome. And even among Russian scholars, even then at the time, and Russian Orthodox priests, this idea was current that Russia is now the new Rome, and they even, if you remember, we mentioned how they even changed the name of the leader of Russia, of the Russian Empire, was called henceforth the Tsar, which is literally the Caesar. So they even adopted the title Caesar, and they saw themselves as this third Rome. And we connected that to the idea of Edom as well, because Rome is in Talmudic literature, and our Jewish literature is referred to as Edom, Edom being also Esav, right? Yaakov and Esav are these twins in the, in the Torah, and Esav is called Edom, the red one. And when our sages refer to Rome, the Roman Empire, they refer to the Roman Empire as Edom, the red empire. And we saw that as well, that in, in Russian history, of course, red is a very prominent color, whether it's the Soviet Union, whether it's Red Square, the Red Army, and so on. The, that color red, that idea of being a dome, plays an important role in Russian history. And I, I should say before I forget that when we talk about Russia, we're not, of course, we're not talking about the good people of Russia. We're talking about Russia as a political entity, you know, whether the regime in Russia and not the people of Russia who are often victims of their regime. And the same is true when we talked about part two last time when we talked about Iran and Paras, because these are kind of like allies in this conflict that also when we talk about Iran or Persia, we don't mean the people of, of Iran who are good people. We mean the, the regime in Iran. And that's, so it's important to mention. So in part one, we presented the idea of could Russia fill, fill that role of Edom, of Magog, uh, and Edom, of course, we are in the final, we always say that we're in the exile of Edom. We are in the, for the Jewish people in particular, there have been four exiles in history, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and the final was the Roman, which is called the Edom, the Galut, the exile of Edom that we are still in. So when we refer to Edom, who are we really talking about today? Because the original Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. So that was the question that we addressed before. So in part one, we talked about just looking at Russian-Ukrainian history and how that conflict arose and the origins, the origins of Kiev, and presented the idea initially. And then in part two, we connected it more to Iran, the Russia-Iran connection. And we talked more about the war of Gog and Magog, which in Ezekiel, in Yechezkel, right, there's this like end of day scenario and this figure named Gog, who's the president, the leader of Magog, plays a role. And we try to talk about what is who is Magog, where is Magog, and according to the most ancient sources, Magog is basically what, we would, what was then called Scythia, which is that area around the Black Sea, that Crimea and the Caucasus region, and kind of like that part of Eastern Europe, let's say, what's today like Ukraine, and that entity that existed back then. So that whole area was referred to as Magog, and that connects to Russia. So now we want to do part three, and we want to finish off the series because there's, there's an old saying that good things come in threes. So uh, we like trilogies. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in the Talmud, you know, in Masechet Shabbat. You remember this? It says that God gave a three-part Torah to a three-part people. You remember this saying? Yeah, so it says, Bricha Chamana, that God, blessed is God who gave a three-part Torah, Orayan Tlitai, Le'am Tlitai, to a three-part people. Uh, by the hand, through a third born person, on the third day, on the th in the third month. 
So God gave the Torah. It's a three-part Torah because the scriptures, the word of God has three parts, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, right? the five books of Moses, and then the prophets, the, the prophets that came after Moses, and then the Ketuvim, the other scriptures, the various, the Megillot and things like that. So we have a three-part, the Tanakh is divided up into three parts. So God gave a three-part scripture to a three-part people because the Jewish people are also divided into Kohen, Levi, Israel, right? There are Kohanim, the priestly class, the Levim, who are like also a mid middle priests, kind of like sub priests, and then the Israel, which is everybody else. So you have a three part Torah that God gave to a three part people, and He did it through a third born, because mm-hmm. Moses was a third born. Moshe was his older sister was Miriam, and then. Aaron, and then Moshe was a third born. So through a person who was a third born child, and on the third day, because in the Torah it says, God told the people, get ready, prepare yourselves, purify, and on the third day, God gave them the Torah, and it was in the third month, in the month of Sivan, when we celebrate Shavuot. So there's this interesting pattern of threes, that God gave a three-part Torah to a three-part people, through the third, on the third, by the third. So we like, we like things in threes, so we want to finish the trilogy and it's been a year, and we're like on the one-year anniversary of this unfortunate war. And what can we... Let's complete this idea of Russia and Third Rome. Can you clarify, what is the difference between Gog and Magog? Or are they the same thing? Yeah, so that's what I want to do now. So there's two questions that I got since then that I want to address, the two like, most frequent questions. One is... Re, like kind of related to what you said, how do we identify, what is the difference between Edom and Magog? Because we're saying on the one hand, there's this entity called Magog. On the other hand, we're in the exile of Edom. Like, is that, let's say the bad guy, is it Edom? Is it Magog? Is it both? Like, how do we differentiate between them? And somebody also asked similarly about Iran, because we mentioned Iran is always called Paras, right? Persia. But we also refer to, in our sources, as Ishmael, because Ishmael is also like the kind of the Muslim world. So is it are we talking about, is it Ishmael, is it Paras, and is it Magog, is it Adom? So we have to distinguish between these people. In, in simple terms, to answer your question directly, Yechezkel says that Gog is the leader of Magog. So Magog is a certain country, and the leader of that country is a person who is called Gog. Like, we don't expect that to be his literal name. It's kind of like a code word for this particular person. So Gog is the leader of Magog. And Magog is, as Ezekiel describes, creates this alliance. Rosh, Meshech, Vetuval, it says really that there's this alliance of Magog, Meshech, Tuval, and then Paras, and Kush, and Put, and all these, there's an alliance of nations that uh, seek to undermine Israel and kind of like destroy I- I- Israel and so on. So we, the, the one question to ask is, just to clarify who is who. So when we talk about Edom, we refer to really the whole Western world, kind of like the Christian world, right? When our sages say Edom, it's a code word for the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire became the Christian Empire. And so Edom can refer to Rome, it can refer to all of Christianity, it can refer to Europe, it can refer, it basically refers to the whole Western world is Edom. And Ishmael refers to the whole kind of Muslim world, originally the Arab world, but also as an extension, the whole Muslim world, even if it's not Arab, like Iran, Iranians are not Arabs, but they're Muslim. So they do fit under the umbrella of Ishmael. So Ishmael is like a wider term. So is Edom. So Edom represents many entities, and Ishmael represents also many different entities. We have 70 root nations that we see in, in Bereshit, in Genesis. We have the table of nations. There's like 70 spiritual root nations in the world. And they're divided up, really, between Edom and Ishmael. That Edom and Ishmael kind of divided the world between them. So we say that Edom rules over 35 of the nations, and Ishmael rules over 35 of the nations. Which is why sometimes you'll see in certain sources, it'll say not 70 nations, but 72 nations. So really it's 70, but the 71st and 72nd is Edom and Ishmael who rule over the others. So they're not one of the original root 70 peoples, but they're more like overarching forces that have dominated the world. So where are we? Christian, the Muslims? We are separate. We are the 73rd nation. Yeah, we are the 73rd nation. 
And the number 73, if you like numbers in particular, is the gematria of also of Chochmah. It's the numerical value of Chochmah, so we're specifically the 70, we're a separate nation. So you have uh, 72, and you have so 36 on one side and 36 on the other side. And so when we say that Paras, Iran is both Paras, and it's also under the umbrella of Ishmael, and Magog is what it is, and it's under the umbrella of Edom. And Edom represents the entire Western Christian kind of European world. And interestingly, the Vilna Gaon had a, a nice uh, allusion to this. Where is this alluded to in the Tanakh? There's a verse that alludes to this particular, these 72 nations, 36 and 36. Uh, you know, they say about the Vilna Gaon that after a certain age, I don't know if it's fact or legend, but it's, it's one of those legends that sounds true and probably is, that after a certain age, the Vilna Gaon only reviewed Tanakh. He had like no need for any other books because he was able to pinpoint like from every verse in Tanakh, he could connect in his mind to all the other places where that particular verse is discussed and cited and quoted. Right? So you give him any verse in Tanakh and he'll tell you, yeah, that was cited in here in the Talmud, here in the Zohar, here in the Midrash, over there, in any book. He had it all hyperlinked in his mind where you just give him one verse and he can. So he, all he had to do was review the Tanakh because through studying the Tanakh, like on each verse, he could review everywhere else in Jewish literature where that verse is mentioned and thereby like kind of learn all of Judaism just by reviewing the Tanakh. And that's how it really should be, because we should be able to just study the actual written Torah and through that be able to extrapolate the whole oral Torah, because everything should have a source in the written Torah. There is actually, really, there is a, a book like that already for you. For the Chumash, there's a Torah Tmimah, uh, which was done by uh, a rabbi, Baruch Levi Epstein, who actually did that, did the job for you, at least for the Chumash. It's a, like a commentary on the Chumash, where on each verse, he says where that verse is cited somewhere else. So he says, this verse is cited here in the Talmud, this verse is cited over there, this verse is cited over there. So it's kind of like a hyperlink before the days of the internet. It was kind of like an internet commentary on the Chumash, where you can link to all other sources. So the Vilna Gaon said, where do you see an, uh, an allusion to the 36 nations, 36 of Edom and 36 of Ishmael in, in the Tanakh? It's in Tehilim, in Psalms. The pasuk is, and we all know this, we've said it many times, Ele barechev va ele basusim. These come on their chariots and these come with their horses. Ve'anachnu and we, b'shem Hashem Eloheinu naskir. And we fight. So the nations fight with their horses and their chariots and their weapons. And we fight with the name of God. Now for most of history, the Jewish people did not have armies to control. And our battle is spiritual. So this is a very nice verse. Uh, but the Vilna Gaon pointed out numerically that Ele Barechev, the word Ele, Aleph Lamed Hey, the value is 36, right? Aleph is 1, Lamed is 30, Hey is 5. So 36, these 36, Barechev with their chariots, Ve Ele, and these 36 with their horses, all these nations that are with all their armies and all their military might, and Ve Anachnu and we as a separate, the 73rd, let's say, nation that fight with the name of God. Okay, so that's a nice allusion to this idea of 36 and 36. And uh, so Edom really represents the entire Western world. And one way to identify which places are Edom, which places are counted as Edom, you'll find a pattern, which is, maybe you've noticed this, that in every major Edomite city, city of Edom, there is, what do you find? You find, you find an Egyptian obelisk very prominently displayed in the center of that city. You know what I'm talking about? So if you've been to, like, to the Vatican in Rome, right, right in the center of the Vatican in that, the main square over there, St. Peter's, you got a huge Egyptian obelisk right at the center. And you go to Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument, right, everywhere in Paris, right, Luxor, you see the Luxor obelisk in Paris if you've been there in England, and in New York there's one, and in Moscow, in the Kremlin there's one as well. And in Istanbul, which is now Muslim, but remember when it was the second Rome, when it was Constantinople, it had an obelisk that was erected there and that's still there. So like every major Edomite center, whether it's Paris, London, New York, Washington, Moscow, they all have, this also has one? Yeah. So they all have, this is something that's really unique to, I, I, I think, to the Western world, that every Roman, let's say, uh, descendant, every Edomite entity has an Egyptian obelisk very prominently displayed at its center. And why Egyptian? 
we mentioned before, because the final exile, as our sages said long ago, is just a repeat of the first exile, the mother of all exiles, which is the Egyptian exile. That's where it all began. And so we are reliving the slavery in Egypt. We're all slaves in the system today, and we don't even know it, or most people don't even realize they're slaves, just like the Israelites in Egypt didn't realize they were slaves. And they often thank their overlords. You remember, they complained to Moses. Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. At least over there, we had cucumbers and watermelons and stuff. Right? We had fish. So that's usually the authorities numb the minds of the populace through bread and circus, through food and entertainment and material pleasures. And meanwhile, they exploit and enslave, and the people don't even realize it. And when we look at how our sages describe the Egyptian slavery, it's very much what's happening today in terms of financial people can't you know, people are controlled very easily through their finances, very hard to make a living, but also even things like our sages say, what does it mean that we say, the Torah says, that they, they worked as befarech. What does that mean, befarech? One of the interpretations is that they made women do male roles, male jobs, men did, had to do women's roles. They completely mixed up the traditional gender roles just to confuse things even further. That was part of the slavery and oppression of Egypt even to that extent. So we're really reliving e Egyptian slavery today without even realizing it. So that, this exile of Edom, it's interesting that in every one of these major cities, you have an Egyptian obelisk just to secretly remind you that you're still in Egypt. <laughs> if you thought you were free, think again. I think Voltaire said that there's none more hopelessly enslaved than he who believes he's free. So. The second question on that note is, so this whole Western world we consider Edom, and then the other world is uh, Ishmael. So within that world, who is the dominant player? Who is the Magog? Who is that the main oppressor of the Jews? And this is the second question that I got, which is, wouldn't it be more fitting to identify that oppressor, that Magog, that superpower, that Roman Empire as the United States? And you'll find that very often, that people will identify the U.S. as, like when, especially when Barack Obama was president, people like to identify him as Gog, for instance. And we mentioned before that, uh, that George Bush, the, the father, was H.W. Bush. His nickname was Magog or something like that, or Gog, or Mag Magog was his nickname in his Skulls and Bones society. So some people point to these things. And, and it's true, I even mentioned in one of my books that it's true that Washington, D.C. was built on a plot of land that was actually originally called New Rome. So that original plot of land, the person who had settled it first had called it New Rome before it was rebuilt and as a city and named after George Washington, obviously. So some people will identify the United States as this big, bad oppressor. And there is an argument to be said for that. However, and that's what I really want to focus on today, which is this Russian Jewish history and what has, how has Jewish history played out in Russia and what role has Russia and the USSR played in Jewish history? A really monumental role. That's what I want to explore today and show you how, whereas in the United States, Jews have always lived pretty comfortably and it's been a safe haven for Jewish people. And the United States is still Israel's biggest ally on the world stage. And, but Russia is quite opposite to that. You know, Jews have played a really important role in American history and America has been generally very good to the Jews. If people don't know this, but probably the single largest individual financier of the American Revolution was a Jew named Haim Solomon. So Haim Solomon probably, from any individual, gave more money for the cause, and probably the United States wouldn't even exist and without him. We were very fundamental in, in their... Uh, perhaps, well, perhaps, sorry, perhaps. Sorry. Perhaps. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So I, I, I'm just trying to say that the United States really wouldn't exist without Jewish support. Jews played an important role in its founding. And J the United States from its beginnings was actually a, a safe haven for Jews. And America's always been good to the Jews. But Russia, I want to show you some things that it's quite on the contrary. Because Jews, many Jews even to this day, right, are Russian and Russian-speaking. Uh, at one point, something like half the world's Jews lived in the Russian Empire. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, in 1772, especially, there was the first partition of Poland. Basically, the Prussians, not the Russians, the Prussians and the Russians. Remember, the Prussia is like the pre-Germany. Prussia is basically what became Germany, let's say, the leading Germanic uh, kingdom. Prussia and Russia and the Habsburgs, the Austro-Hungarians, basically decided to split Poland between them. 
So that first partition of Poland was in 1772, and then another partition later. By the, late, by the end of the 18th century, Poland was basically split between these three, so Russia now had an even larger, massive influx of Jews. And basically during this time, with Queen Catherine of Russia, the great Catherine the Great, she basically confined the Jews to what was called the Pale of Settlement. So Jews couldn't live in Russia proper. A Jew couldn't legally like, live in Moscow unless maybe they got a special exemption. But Jews were confined to the Pale of Settlement, which is like what's today Belarus, Ukraine, a little bit of Poland, that region, that region of uh, Eastern Europe. So that's where Jews were forced to live. And at that time, in the 18th century, 40% of the world's Jews, 5 million Jews lived there. So it was like the single largest place where Jews lived. And that policy continued until World War I. And Jews were not allowed to live in the big cities. They had to live in small towns. That's where you had the shtetls. And like, they were very impoverished. They couldn't hold most professions. They couldn't even be farmers. They were confined to very limited professions. They didn't have many educational opportunities. You know, unless they converted to Christianity, most of society was kind of like barred to them. And so life was not very good over there. And they also were, there was an imposition. The Russians thought it would be a great idea. We can assimilate the Jews by taking their young men into the military. And these are the famous, can, infamous Cantonist laws. It applied really not just to Jews. It applied to everybody. It was basically ways to conscript Russians into the army. And, but for the Jews in particular, they, the Russian Empire required that for every thousand Jews, four had to be sent from every community. And they had like quotas of how many Jews had to be sent to join the Russian army. And they would have to serve. They would have to go to military school for six years and serve in the military for 25 years. And the hopes was that through that, we will assimilate them and make them Russians. And that there was this kind of push to convert them. And if they didn't convert to Christianity, they could not get a promotion in the army. So they would stay, you know, just at the bottom ranks. And throughout that time, only eight or nine actually got promoted. This, despite, like, with, without converting. Only eight or nine were, like, so great that the Imperial Army gave them a uh, promotion even though they stayed Jews. So you only had eight or nine in all the whole history over this like century, you only had eight or nine Jews who were officers in the Imperial Army because the rest had to convert to go anywhere to, m to make it in the army. Therefore what, others converted? And, and the yeah, they say it's estimated that at least 30% actually did convert. And many more didn't convert, but basically intermarried, of course, because they were, they were posted God knows where, and they would have married uh, others. And so they were still, a, a great majority of them were gone within a few generations, were no longer connected to Judaism in any way. So it was, it was quite tragic. And it's estimated that uh, up to, it's, depending on which numbers, as low as 30,000 and as high as 70,000 Jewish boys were forcibly abducted and converted in this way. So it was, it was not a happy time to live in the Pale of Settlement in the Russian Empire to be a Jew, which is again where the majority of the world's the single largest place for Jews to live at that time, and it was terrible. And of course you had the pogroms. You always had these persecutions, soldiers raiding your village, killing, raping, pillaging, and there were many, many pogroms. Some were local, some were large, some were state sanctioned, some were just bands and thug, bands of like thugs and soldiers who were just looking to have fun. And uh, again, over the whole era, even before the Pale of Settlements, we know that the Khmelnytsky massacre was probably the worst. That was in the mid 17th century. And Khmelnytsky today is a great hero. Ukraine's like national, one of their founding fathers, who's on their money who's in their main square in Kiev. And Khmelnytsky killed something like 150,000 Jews, probably. So that was one of the worst pogroms in this, in this region. But they say during the Holocaust that the Ukrainians killed 2 million Jews. I don't know if it's 2 million, but it's definitely... The Ukrainians had uh, their own Nazi SS division. And yeah, the Babi Yar massacre, well, that was a bad one. I think that was like maybe 30, 40, 50,000 Jews, yeah. And probably one of the last great pogroms or terrible pogroms was in, in uh, Kishinev in, in Moldova in 1903. And the death toll was relatively small, relatively. Maybe 150 were killed, but thousands of homes were destroyed. Women were raped. It was really a terrible sight. And that actually inspired the second Aliyah to Israel. 
Uh, the second Aliyah started in 1904. Hmm? The second Aliyah was in 1904, and it was almost entirely Russian Jews that came to Israel. So if you know your, the, story, the history of Israel a little bit, the first Aliyah didn't really accomplish much. Most of the people that came to Israel in the first Aliyah in the late 1800s ended up leaving. Uh, but the second Aliyah, these were people who were, had experienced such horrible lives in the Russian Empire. It was something like 35,000 Jews, almost all from Russia, came to Israel, and they had nowhere to go back, so they made it work. And that was the critical push um, that allowed uh, Israel to become a thing. The second Aliyah started in 1904. The first kibbutz, the Ganya Aleph, was started in 1909. And Tel Aviv was founded in 1909. So all these things were actually took place within, during the second Aliyah. So that was critical. And this is a, a good segue into two major movements emerged. Because life in the pale was so horrible, Jews had to deal with it somehow. And two major movements emerged to deal with this terrible reality. One was to deal with the problem from a religious way, from a spiritual way, and the other was to deal with it politically and nationally. So the first one was Hasidism. Right? The Hasidic movement took off here in this place, in the Pale of Settlement, within the Russian Empire, to try to address this problem in a religious way. Say, like, yes, life sucks. Yes, we're poor. Yes, we're oppressed. But let's be happy anyways. Right? Hasidism was, like, very ecstatic. It was just very much about music and dance and alcohol, and smoking, and having fun, and it was more lenient with the law, right? Like even to this day, like Hasidic groups will be lenient with prayers, like prayer times, right? Like Chabad, your local Chabad probably starts Shabbat services at 10 a.m., which is like way past the halachic time, especially here, like depending on, what, like in the summer, let's say. It's way past the halachic time to do all these things, but like that was their thing. It was like, take it easy, right? Pray when you feel like it, make sure you've slept well, you have good energy, Right? Like, it was more lenient. That's one of the reasons why it was opposed. Right? Hasidism was very strongly opposed originally. The Hasidic leaders were even excommunicated. One of the reasons was because they were very lenient. A lot of the early stories of the early Hasidism was like very light with, more lenient with Jewish law. Saying like, take it easy. Let's take it easy. Life's hard as it is. Let's have fun. Let's enjoy. Let's find more spiritual ecstasy. Right, right. That's right. So, interestingly enough, some of the early Chabad rebbe's actually credited the Vilna Gaon, who excommunicated them, credited him with saving Hasidism in the sense that because he opposed them, it forced the Hasidim to become more alachic and to be more serious. And so there are statements from the early Chabad rebbe, like the third Lubavitch rebbe, that, if, that because the Vilna Gaon opposed them, that inspired the Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, to write the Shulchan Aruch Arav. He wrote an Alachic text. Why did he write an Alachic text? He wanted Hasidim to remain within the Alachic box and to remember that you still have to be Torah observant Jews. You know, they didn't want to slide towards a reform, you know, and which was also uh, becoming popular at that at the same time in Western Europe more. And uh, so there's even sources like that that, that have the earlier Lubavitch Rebbe's even thanking, that the, thanking the mitnagdim, the people that opposed them, because they were able to, in so doing, keep them more alachic and keep them more in line. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, I would uh, ask you to visit Kotsk blog. He does a lot of great uh, work on this, and he has a lot of great articles about the history of Hasidism. Uh, there's also a good book uh, called The Quest for Authenticity, and you can check that out as well. Uh, so that, that early Hasidism doesn't really exist anymore, right? Like the Hasidim that we have today, except perhaps maybe Chabad, but the Hasidic groups today, they've retained the clothing, but uh, the original Hasidic of the, Hasidism of the Baal Shem Tov, that really ecstatic uh, Hasidism, has mostly been replaced. You know, the Hasidic groups today are basically became more like the Haredi, Litvish, and, uh, and they've admitted that. They've admitted that. You know, this, this Fas MS uh, said that uh, the, the Hasidism of the early days is that he even went so far as to say that, like, we don't need that ecstasy anymore. We should just focus on Torah and mitzvot, right? Like, so it became more like mainstream Haredi. The Satmer Rebbe said that the, Has the Hasidism of the Baal Shem Tov is dead. It no longer exists. You know, it's, it's totally different. The early Hasidim were 
a, a totally different than what we would expect today. Chabad still retains a lot of the qualities of the early Hasidim. And, and within Chabad, you will hear it often said that they're the only legitimate Hasidim left. They will make that claim. And they're probably right. Breslev, so. Breslev also. Breslev also. Chabad like really carries the message in terms of their work in loving every Jew and going all over the world and like in their Kiruv and, and all that. that. That's really... That was really the idea of the Baal Shem Tov, right? Who had that vision where he ascended to heaven and he was told that Mashiach won't come until you spread your ways all over the world. And so Chabad is really takes that kind of personally and makes it their personal mission to do. And that's why Chabad's been so great and so successful. So the first, the first movement that took off in the Russian Empire amidst the suffering of the Pale of Settlement was Hasidism. Again, to deal with the problem from a more religious, spiritual way to make people happy. But like, as we've seen, Hasidism kind of, the original Hasidism really kind of petered out by the end of the 19th century. It, the early Hasidism was no longer there. Hasidism kind of went mainstream and went more like Haredi mainstream by the end of the 19th century. So it didn't last. And so at, to replace it almost, you had another movement that took off. Right as Hasidism was like slowing down, another movement really took off. And that's to deal with the problem. Well, that didn't work. Let's deal with the problem politically and nationally, which is Zionism. Right? So Zionism really had its beginnings, of course, before all of this. And they're always what, what you would call proto-Zionist. Hasidism itself, early Hasidism, was very Zionistic because all the early Hasidim wanted to go to Israel and like usher in the redemption. They said, we're going to go there and we're going to like make God send Mashiach. And, and there's even like stories of like the Baal Shem Tov, like collaborating with other rabbis saying, let's just go. He tried. The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, tried to make Aliyah. It didn't work. He, he ended up coming back to Europe. But other Hasidic groups actually did go to Israel and succeeded. Right? The most famous is uh, Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. So he, in 1777, actually got 300 Jews to Israel. And they settled there. And they remained there. So, and there were other Hasidic groups, and later even also non-Hasidic groups, that actually came to Israel. So they already started this like, Zionistic idea. And so there is an overlap there between Zionism and Hasidism. And it's kind of ironic, again, comparing modern day Hasidism to the early Hasidism, because the early Hasidism was all about let's bring in the redemption, let's make God send the redemption, let's like actively go to Israel and settle the land. And today, most Hasidic groups are the exact opposite. Right? They're saying we can't force the redemption, we have to wait for God. Most of them don't support the state of Israel, although that's not only because of this, it's only for all, for all kinds of reasons. Because uh, of the secular state and all of the big problems that the secular state has done for religious people. So, on that note, are you talking about political, modern political Zionism or like religious Zionism? So, I think a little bit of both, and I'll, I'll explain. I think a little bit of both. So, Zionism really, I think we mentioned this before, we associate Zionism with like Theodore Herzl. You know, and, and mostly like Ashkenazis, but actually it started with a lot of Sephardi rabbis that really pushed this. And the main one was Rabbi Yehuda Alkali. Rabbi Yehuda Alkali, he, uh, in 1840, he established the first real Zionist organization, which was called the Society for the Settlement of, of Israel. <clears throat> that was in 1840, which is 5600 on the Jewish calendar. And we mentioned that year before, because the Zohar has a prophecy that in the year 5600, the redemption would begin. And... Rav Yehuda Alkali, he said that now is the time. According to the Zohar, this is the final deadline. The Zohar has many calculations for when it would be an auspicious time for the redemption to begin. This is the last one, 5600. And he actually said, Rabbi Yehuda, he said that if we don't do it now, God will do it for us. Like we have one final century to do it. This is an amazing prophecy. In 1840, he said we have 100 years to make Israel happen. And if we don't, then... God will make it happen and it won't be in a good way. Right? And that's kind of what happened because 1840 and then you go to 1940 and then wow. you know, following the Holocaust, that's, that's kind of gave the final approval from the world. You know, it took millions of Jews to be murdered for the world to say, okay, you know what, maybe we should give these people their own state. And only yeah. So, uh, but, but uh, Rabbi Yehuda Alkali made that, he was a great Kabbalist, and he made that kind of almost like a prophecy. He said, we have, based on the Zohar, we have 100 years to make it happen. And so he started this organization in 1840 to start settling Israel. And his ideas, people today think they're 
Herzl's ideas, but they're not. He said we have to make agricultural colonies, we have to get Jews farming again, make them self-sufficient, we, we have to get them to speak Hebrew uh, so that we can unite all the Jews from Europe, from here, from there, this every Jewish... Rabbi, uh, yeah, Rabbi Alkali said that what, what's our common language? It's Hebrew. That's our language of our scriptures. That's our Torah language. We have to make it our spoken language too because otherwise, you know, he's far, like he probably spoke Ladino and then there's Yiddish and then there's Bukharian and then like how do we get, how do we all speak the same language if we're all coming back to Israel? We got to return to Hebrew. So we have to do agricultural colonies. He said we're going to buy the land from the Ottomans. We're not going to conquer it. We're going to buy the land piece by piece. And he outlined all of this in his book which was called Goral Le'ashem. It was published in 1857, while Rabbi Alkali was the chief rabbi of Semlin, Serbia. And in his congregation, who was one of his congregants and one of his friends, was Shimon Leib Herzl, who was Theodore Herzl's grandfather. And so today, scholars will admit and will agree that Herzl probably got a lot of his ideas from the book Goral Hashem, which was a religious book by the chief rabbi of, Ser- of Semlin, Serbia. And a copy of it would have surely fallen into Theodore Herzl's uh, hands. And so... Uh, right, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, but Herzl, I mean, he played an important role into turning it into a mass movement. That's really, it's not that he came up with the ideas. He was able to organize it. That the organization was key. He was able to get the support. He was able to meet with the right people, with the right world leaders, with the right philanthropists and get the whole thing into a mass movement. Right. And, and he died young, so he didn't really see much fruit from what Herzl didn't. Um, but, thanks, but really, Zionism, you can argue, it began among religious people, and the Hasidim played this big proto-Zionist role, and Herzl actually helped to spread it more to Western Europe, you know, to England, to France, Germany, Austria. And, but it really only, like we saw, took, became a force in Eastern Europe, uh, the Eastern Europeans who lived in the Pale of Settlement who saw that they really have no hope, right? They tried, like nothing was working to make their lives better. And so Zionism spread very rapidly in Eastern Europe, especially in the yeshivas. The yeshiva students were like, this is it. And, and many yeshiva students were becoming Zionists. That's where religious Zionism takes off uh, in various ways. And many examples of yeshiva students who became staunch, fervent, passionate Zionists. One of them is uh, Mayor Barilan. We've all heard of Barilan University. Bar- Do you know what Barilan's original last name was? Barilan was originally Mayor Berlin. Uh, who, do you, does that name sound familiar? Mayor Barilan was the son of the Netziv. The Netziv was the Rosh Yeshiva of Volozhin which was like the most famous yeshiva in Eastern Europe. Uh, the Netziv is Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. And his son is Mayor Berlin, who became Mayor Bar Ilan in Israel. And, you know, this is kind of the spiritual founding figure of Bar Ilan University, who was a rabbi. He was, yeah, he was religious. Mayor Bar Ilan was religious. He was always Orthodox. He was his name? Yeah, in Israel. Right? Like, like many of them did, right? And even the Netziv himself was a Zionist. He wasn't vocal about it, but he was a Zionist. Like, he believed that this is it. Like, this is the right way to go. And it was a very interesting, amazing, amazing figure. You should all, like, read up on the Netziv. Really amazing. See, he was the last Rosh Yeshiva, actually, of Volozhin, because the Russians shut it down. The Russians forced the Yeshiva to teach secular studies and forced their curriculum upon them. And he said, you know what? It's better to close the Yeshiva than to allow this. So he was the last. The, the Volozhin Yeshiva closed with him. Um, another famous one, one more, is Wolf Wisotsky. You know Wisotsky, the tea? Everybody knows Wisotsky tea. Yeah, he was the, called the king of Russian tea in his day, very wealthy. He, also a graduate of Volozhin. He was a graduate of Volozhin Yeshiva. He became huge in the tea trade. And then he couldn't stay in Russia because the anti-Semitism was too much. And so he moved to Israel. And he was a huge force in the Zionist. Like Israel, we, like people know about Rothschild. Edmund Rothschild gave a lot of money for Israel. Moses Montefiore gave a lot. Wolf Wisotsky gave a lot. So he gave tons, millions, maybe billions. And uh, he set up the first settlements in Gaza, Nablus, Lod, Yafo, all of this. That was him. He paid for a lot of the first schools, hospitals. Uh, he gave something like the amount of money that he gave in rubles is like incredible. It's some, somebody estimated it as like in today's value it would be billions of dollars. Like that's how wealthy he was. And he was a graduate of Volozhin, also religious his whole life. 
his whole life. He never abandoned, abandoned the faith. So you see all these like Russian Jews that became a force to make Israel happen. And I already mentioned Tel Aviv was founded amidst the second Russian Aliyah and the Ganya Aleph. And look at all of Israel's leaders. Almost all of them are somehow connected to Russia. David Ben-Gurion was Polish-Russian. Golda Meir, Ukrainian-Russian. Moshe Dayan, also Ukrainian-Russian. Ariel Sharon and Menachem Begin, Belarusian. Fun fact, when Menachem Begin was born, the midwife that delivered him was Ariel Sharon's grandmother. <laughs> That's how close uh, they were. So, but Sharon uh, wasn't Jewish at all, I think. That, yeah, that's, I've heard that. Maybe not. Um, <clears throat> no, Netanyahu's are also, Netanyahu's get their name from their grandfather, who was a rabbi also. And, uh, oh, guess where he studied? Also Volozhin. So his name was Nathan Milikovsky. Nathan Milikovsky studied at Volozhin. He was a rabbi and then became a religious Zionist rabbi. And so the, he, his pen name was Netanyahu, Nathan Milikovsky. And then that's where the last name came from. So also, all, all these people come from the Russian Empire. And uh, so when Israel formed initially, Stalin supported it. Right? Like, he thought this is going to be like a communist country. They're going to p- join the Soviet umbrella. A lot of influence over Israel for a long That's time. That's right. All the kibbutz movement. That's right. They thought the kibbutzim were like kind of communist little communes. And he thought that it's going to be, uh, they're going to join the Soviet bloc. And that didn't happen. And so Stalin really turned on Israel. And the USSR turned on Israel. And have you heard of the doctor's plot? In 1953, uh, Stalin actually tried to exterminate all the Jews in, his, in the Soviet Union. It was almost the second Holocaust. It was a really fascinating story. On January 9th, in the state newspaper, Pravda, he wrote, they published an article that's saying that Jewish doctors are poisoning Soviet officials. There is a secret conspiracy among Zionists funded by the Americans to poison uh, Russian do- uh, officials, Soviet officials, do- even Stalin, they're, tr- they're attempting to assassinate Stalin. And so there was a huge wave of anti-Semitism in January, February 1953. And guess what? Stalin said we're going to make four new, he commissioned four concentration camps in Kazakhstan and Siberia. And he said we're going to take all the Jews and bring them to these concentration camps for their own protection because the Russian citizens are so passionately against the Jews for harming our people. And so Stalin planned on March 6, 1953, to start deporting Jews to these gulags, these concentration camps, and to, you know, finish. He had his own final solution for the Jews. And guess what happened? They were supposed to start deporting them on March 6th. It was Purim. That's right. It was Purim, just a few days after Purim. The deportations were going to start March 6, 1953. Stalin died March 5, 1953, the day before. Uh, so the 1st of March was Purim. On Purim, Stalin was found unconscious, or the day after. He was found unconscious and bleeding in his room. Huh? Uh, <laughs> and he died on the 5th. There's a famous story of the Lubavitcher Rebbe who gave a sicha that night on Purim. And he was actually talking about the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire. And it was a very bizarre story. He was talking about when the Russian previous, the Tsar of Russia, was deposed. And the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe asked all his Hasidim to go vote. Like, you guys have to go vote. We have to, now that we have democracy, we have to be good democratic citizens and do our, our part. And he basically gave a story about how Russians were, uh, one of the Hasidim saw Russians screaming, hurra, 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 right? Like, hooray. And this chassid, who didn't know what they were saying, you know, he only, probably only spoke Yiddish, thought they were, that they were saying, hu-ra, that he's evil. So he thought that they were all saying that the, the tzad was evil, the Caesar was evil, and he's finally gone, the king of Russia. And so the Rebbe started saying, hu-ra, 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 right? like, and, and the chassidim were like weird in the sicha. They thought something strange was going on, and they didn't realize that at the same time, so, like, Chabad thinks that, like, Chabad Negim will tell you that the Rebbe did something, like, on a spiritual level uh, that affected events that were going on in Moscow, and maybe he did, because at the same time, in Moscow, Stalin was having a, a mishte, a party with his buddies, with his top uh, officials, and it seems like they poisoned him. So, his uh, head of his secret police, Lavrenti Beria, probably, maybe either slipped something in his drink or into his food, more likely, and so then... Yeah, 
Stalin didn't recover from that. And they made sure that doctors wouldn't get into his... He collapsed in his room that night. And they made sure that no doctors would go in there for a very long time. And then Stalin died. And you should read a great book called Stalin's Last Crime by Jonathan Brent and Vladimir Naumov. Very interesting book that goes into this and shows uh, everything that we know about this event. And in 1956, the next leader of Russia, Khrushchev, right, he gave a famous secret speech where for the first time they started to denounce Stalin, which would have before that been unthinkable. And in his secret speech, he actually suggested very clearly that they did him in. They personally assassinated him because he was planning to purge them. It seems like he had gone completely nuts. He was planning World War III. He was going to use the doctor's plot as a way to blame America for like trying to assassinate him and like launch a preemptive strike against America. So his own guys said, okay, let's, that's enough. That's enough of Stalin. And they poisoned him. And Lavrenti Beria actually apparently boasted and said, yeah, I saved all you guys. I killed him. And uh, yeah. So, and it happened on Purim, which is amazing because just like on Purim, we have like Haman who was trying to exterminate all the Jews and Stalin like in Haman fashion was trying to kill all the Jews shortly after Purim and himself died. Everything was upside down. Uh, Just a last little note on that. Uh, In the book, in Stalin's Last Crime, the authors point something really cool. They say that the main, uh, their main problem for Stalin and his police with the doctor's plot was that there was a Jewish doctor, a woman, who refused to confess. They tortured all the Jewish doctors to confess, but one of them wouldn't confess. And that's a problem because if one claims innocence, then it ruins everything. Like you need everybody to confess, you know, or else like it doesn't work. And she refused to confess, even though she was like terribly, that she was, yeah. Uh, they were torturing these doctors, these innocent doctors, to confess that they were trying to assassinate Stalin and that they were poisoning Russian officials. And, she, and the others were like tortured so badly that they said, okay, whatever, right? They confessed under torture. But she did not confess, even under torture. Her name was Sofia Karpai, and their authors write really beautifully. They wrote, it satisfies the imagination to think that the fate of the Jews of Russia might have depended on this latter-day unknown Esther. Right, which is really nice that it like it was again a woman who held out and who was able to like staunch their plans for a very long time, a Jewish woman, and helped to prevent this catastrophe. So, but anyway, the KGB didn't uh, Stalin's death didn't stop the Soviet attack uh, on the Jews and on Israel in particular. And so, I just want to point out, and we're going to end with this. <clears throat> Russia's role in the Arab-Israeli conflict, or the Soviet role in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And also this comes from uh, a a really good article that I can link to by Ellie Cohen and Elizabeth Boyd, which points out a few things. That the founder of the PLO, of the Palestine Liberation Organization, is is the KGB. This was hatched by the KGB. Uh, Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas, who's still the president, were KGB agents. Mahmoud Abbas, it's not a secret that he studied in Moscow. He did his PhD in Moscow. You know what his PhD was on? The current president of the PLO, this like never-ending dictator, he's been the president. You know, he was elected, whatever it is, 15 years ago for a five-year term, and he's still the president. You know what his PhD is on? On on denying the Holocaust. Yeah, he wrote a PhD on uh, that the Holocaust didn't happen. And uh, by the way, other sources, like very well sourced that he, that Mahmoud Abbas was originally a KGB agent in Damascus. He was a KGB secret agent operating in Damascus first before he became dictator for life of the Palestinians. Uh, So all these people were KGB agents. Um, The KGB and the Soviet Union armed the Palestinian, all their terrorists, including the Entebbe. The Entebbe attack was planned and uh, they were uh, armed by the USSR. Even more scarier than that is something that was called by the KGB Operation SIG. And Operation SIG was basically to undermine Israeli, also American democracy, every way that they could, and to infiltrate every aspect of Israel, and also to change world opinion about Israel, to make Israel the enemy, the Zionists are the enemy. Remember, it was the Soviet Union that sponsored the UN resolution that that supposedly claimed Zionism. that Zionism is racism, right? Which was later repealed in 1991. It was Resolution 3379 in 1975, and it was revoked by the UN in 1991. But the resolution was that Zionism is equivalent to racism. The head of the KGB, Yuri Andropov, he said, 
quote, we have only to keep repeating our themes that the United States and Israel are fascists, imperial Zionist countries bankrolled by rich Jews. They just have to keep repeating it and eventually people will believe it. It's like total brainwashing operation. Right, yeah, same idea, same playbook. Uh, and to this day, you see that, that conspiracy that was hatched by the KGB, that rich Jews and Zionists are plotting to take over the world. They run, right? The elders of Zion. Who wrote the Protocols of the Elders of Zion? It was it or- originally published in Russia. Right? And those same conspiracy theories, you still see them today, right? You send them to me all the time, right? The Jews, the evil Jews are controlling the world. The Zionists are controlling the world, right? It all, it's really a product of Russian and, and later Soviet and KGB um, propaganda. It was really all a KGB plot to divide and conquer, right? Destabilize Western societies, transform them. Uh, maybe you've seen this interview with Yuri Bezmenov. Have you seen this? Bezmenov is the... Uh... So he's a KGB agent that defected to Canada, actually. Right. I think he lives in Win- lived in Windsor in 1970. Well, and he gave... Society. That's right. He gave an interview in 1984 where he outlines the KGB plans to destroy the United States. And if you listen to this interview that was given in 1984, today it's like it's precisely what has happened to America. He said our goal is to, basically he said the KGB is not what you think. It's not an espionage organization. That's not the point. The KGB is an, it's a subversion organization. It's about infiltration, right? And it's a brainwashing organization. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with the academics, we're going to make them left-leaning, communists. We're going to start splitting the country on all kinds of lines, by gender, by race, black versus white, like all these things, class by class. by. Well, we're going to split the country. We're going to divide and conquer. We're going to get everybody to hate each other, and we're going to destroy the country from the inside. And he goes step by step how we're going to do it. We're going to start with the academia. We're going to infiltrate the minds of the students. Then they're going to move. And slowly, slowly, you raise. Also... Yeah, this operation that they planned to destabilize Western democracy, the U.S., Israel, all of these things. So, but that's, that's a, a plan of like 50 to 100 years. Yeah, he said it would oh, take 20 to 40 years or something like that. It's 15 yeah. years to demoralize yeah. a whole society. Right. It doesn't take as long as you... That's the same, that's the same type of ingredients of, of, of anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theory also. Yeah. But this that, is, someone so sophisticated, someone so sophisticated, they can get, get in and, and literally start mind controlling everybody. Yeah, that's, it's all part of the same thing, right? It, they, they can blame, the KGB can blame the Jews for what they're doing. That's precisely their plan, right? Like, we're doing this and we're going to blame it on the Zionists. So, it's the USSR and the KGB that changed the world's perception from Israel is the underdog facing, is outnumbered 100 to 1 by Muslims and, Ar- and Arabs in particular, but Israel is the underdog to, no, now the Palestinians are the underdog, right? And Israel is like the, the one single Jewish state, tiny little place. Israel is the oppressor. Right? And, the, and the poor Palestinians that have nowhere to go, you know, all the 50 other Muslim countries in the world, it's not, it's not, not enough, all the other Arab countries. Anyway, you get the point. So it's the, the, the Soviets hatched this plan to say, you know, originally, like pre-state Israel, when people said Palestinian, it meant Jew. Like the, the Arabs were the Arabs and the Palestinians were the Jews, right? If you look at like flag of Palestine in the 1930s, it had the Magen David on it, right? When the country became Israel, they started referring to them as Israelis, and now the Arabs became the Palestinians, but that only happened much later, again, with the PLO and so on. You know, Walid Shobat, he, he said this very famously, he's a Muslim, former terrorist actually for the PLO, and now he's like a pro-Israel kind of, I, I guess, pro-Israel activist. He said, why is it that on June 4th, 1967, I was Jordanian and overnight I became a Palestinian, right? As long as Jordan controlled the West Bank and annexed it, nobody cared, right? Jordan actually annexed the West Bank. Nobody cared. Yeah, it's Jordan, same thing. But as soon as on June 5th, suddenly, oh, well, no, Israel can't have, no, for sure. That's, that's a red line, right? As long as he was Jordanian, that was fine. Suddenly, overnight, he became a Palestinian. And just, as a, as a, just to see how deep the infiltration goes, in 1992, uh, another KGB agent defected to the UK. His name was Vasily Mitrokhin, and he revealed all kinds of things, most of which are still classified by MI5, by the British, but some have been declassified. In those documents, at least three members of Knesset in Israel, at least three, were KGB operatives. On Israel's Knesset... Jewish who knows? They were all from the left-wing Mapam party. The Mapam, which is today Meretz, uh, not surprisingly, 
you know, even their logo is like kind of very communist-y, like hammer and sickle style. So, uh, but yeah, back then, like in the 50s, 60s, at least three members of Knesset that we know of were secretly KGB operatives. On Israel, that's how deep it goes. Like on Israel's parliament, supposedly representing the interests of Israelis and the Jewish people. And don't think for a second that it's not happening today. All right, nothing's changed. Right? Just to conclude, I want to go back to the original question. Like, who is the be- if there was a good candidate for Edom, for Magog, for this oppressive force that's been subversive and that's specifically for Jews, that's been oppressing Jews and sub- subverting this in the state of Israel and infiltrating and attacking, and whether it's the pogroms, whether it's the Cantonist laws, the Pale of Settlement, take your pick. Right? Uh, up through the present, through terrorism, through funding the, the Palestinians against Israel and, and changing the world's opinion to make Israel the bad guy always, whether it's at the UN or in the media or whatever, who is pushing all of this. And it's not the United States. Unfortunately, it's Russia and the USSR. Right? The Russian Empire began and it began this trend and it continued with the USSR. And it seems like it's still happening today. So we don't really know. It seems like Russia's relationship today, modern Russia's relationship with Israel, is better. They seem to be on good terms. They have a lot of trade. Where Russia stands today, we don't know. But in recent history, for sure, probably the single most, uh, if there's one political entity that has been a thorn at the side of the Jewish people and Israel, it's probably Russia, the USSR, and so on. To bring it full circle on that notion, of Russia and the third Rome and the Talmud's famous prophecy that there will be three Romes and when the third Rome will fall you should anticipate expect Mashiach to come because there won't be a fourth Rome so uh, perhaps we are in that could this war lead to that Russia seems to be doing quite all right even with the war even with the sanctions so what this means for us, we don't know. It remains to be seen. But it's just interesting to point out Russian history, how Russian oppression really is what led to both Hasidism, to the establishment of the state of Israel. Would Israel exist today without Russian oppression? Probably not. <coughs> and as we've seen, whether it's the second Aliyah, whether it's all these political leaders and prime ministers of Israel, all the big movers and shakers came from the Russian and uh, the former Russian Empire. The last point is just that Hasidism came out in, of Russian oppression, and I think it's Hasidism and Chabad Hasidism, but Hasidism that has put that in our minds, the notion of redemption, of Geula, that the redemption is near. And remember, the early Hasidim in particular were all about bringing about the redemption, and that's what we're awaiting, and uh, hopefully that's what we will see soon, God willing. So we'll end with that.